McPherson, Ellsworth, from, from Ellsworth, Topeka, and other parts unknown. So I'll let him uh, tell you whatever he wants to about himself and uh, we'll let him uh, start the program. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jerry, and I'll I think someone may be trying to mute me here. So uh, can everybody hear me? Is that okay? okay. I can. I can. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, I have been doing talks at Village now, gosh, I don't know, for six or seven years, maybe longer. It seems to run together. This is uh, our first, my first time doing a Zoom with all of you. There's new faces that I've seen sort of be introduced. So that's fun. That It's kind of a different crowd. I will try not to shout. Uh, my wife loves to tease me. Uh, I still don't understand the miracle of modern telecommunications. So I feel like if I'm not screaming, you may not hear me from 200 miles away, but uh, I'll try to stay at a normal uh, level of speech. Uh, but I'm looking forward to this. Jerry approached me with this idea a few months ago um, of, of discussing these two videos, well, and the interview and then the video. Um, I like to approach this as kind of a law professor. I want all of us, myself included, to be provoked. So uh, I want this to be an intriguing conversation. Uh, this uh, has always historically been a very safe space, and I would imagine even online it remains a safe space where we can discuss ideas and uh, delve into uh, agriculture in a way that hopefully we all leave with something. Uh, but it is kind of fun. For me, I have never conducted this meeting from my home in Ellsworth. So uh, just a quick little bit of show and tell. Uh, this is um, uh, a certified organic field that has been certified organic now for um, three or four years. I don't exactly remember. Uh, but it is Kernza, the Land Institute's perennial uh, grain, the very first perennial grain, and um, it's difficult to say this exactly, but I believe this may, what you're looking at, may be the oldest commercial field of Kernza. So there were scientific plots prior to this, but this, uh, this may be the oldest commercial field of Kernza uh, on the planet, uh, which is always fun to say because uh, Kearns is so early that uh, it's really just beginning, but I've had this uh, in Kearns and now since 2014. The other cool thing that I didn't even think about getting to do show and tell on, but I realized while I'm here at home, I can show a few things. If you can see this, um, that is a fabulous leaf fossil uh, that I picked up right here. And there's a great story behind leaf imprints in the Dakota sandstone. This is Dakota sandstone. And I think I've even shared this before at, uh, a, at a village church talk uh, in the past, but uh, these are, I don't wanna say they're common, but you can find them pretty easily in different spots around the Dakota formation, which is largely in Ellsworth County. And, and I have a very good cache of them right here on the farm. And what makes them intriguing uh, beyond if you're a paleobotanist is that uh, one of the earliest fossil George Sternberg came out to Ellsworth County to be the post physician at Fort Harker. He would go on to be the Surgeon General of the U.S. Army in Washington, D.C., but he was stationed here in Ellsworth, brought his entire family out here, including his father, Levi, who planted our Presbyterian church and then went on to plant a bunch of Presbyterian churches all throughout central Kansas. But Charles, they all came out to farm. Charles found these leaf fossils and he was so taken by them uh, that it was almost his St. Augustine moment uh, to tip, you know, pick this and go hunt more fossils and forget farming. So he went back to, uh, at the time, the, the University of Kansas State, or in Manhattan that would become Kansas State University, studied under Benjamin Mudge, um, and then went out and picked up fossils all over the Western United States 
but got his start. He was inspired uh, right here uh, in, in the central part of Ellsworth County. And so I'm very fond of where I'm from. Uh, and I'm also very fond of uh, the mystery of fossils that can lead you uh, entirely down different career paths. So uh, that's a bit about what we're looking at. Uh, but this evening's talk is going to be after these next two videos. So some of you may have watched them in advance. I apologize if you did, it, although it's not much. We're talking 15 minutes total. And I think it's just going to facilitate much better conversation if we watch them all fresh. And uh, Jerry, I don't care which one you start with, uh, that one is a two trailer, the other is an interview. So what we see. Jerry, you may need to unmute the computer. I seem to be muted. We'll try this again. Thank you. Let me know if it doesn't come through again. Simple solution, waiting. Can you hear it? Can you hear me? Can you hear it? I can't, we can't hear it. It's part of it. I stopped it. Can you hear me, though? Yes. Yes, okay. yes we hear you. So much bad news about our planet. It's so warm. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet. And it's as old as dirt. All of our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soil, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to be bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant, healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. <laughs> There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you.
All right, now let's hear from Bill Gates. Okay, I turn it back. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll see how this goes in terms of a conversation. I am more than comfortable having a free-flowing conversation. I don't know if that's easier to do through uh, the chat um, with questions uh, or, or how we'll do this. So for now, I think um, we can chat if you have uh, things that you would like to suggest as I go, we'll do that. If that's not working well, then Jerry, we can figure out if we just unmute everybody and, and talk about it that way. Uh, before I've got three primary questions or points that I want to talk about after those two videos. Uh, before I do those, of course, it's a little unfair to poor Kiss the Ground, who had a two and a half minute trailer versus the 13 minute. But I mean, uh, we all can understand basically that those are the, the um, duality of our question of sustainability. Both those um, videos were dealing with people that are deeply concerned about climate change and what to do about it. Uh, but they come at it from very different ways. Before I start in on my three big questions, uh, and I know Zach Pastor is on here too, and so he's probably thinking the same thing. I have to address the minor uh, incorrect, I can't blame all journalists, they're doing the very best they can, but as a wind and solar guy, nuclear power doesn't store energy uh, differently than wind and solar. No energy, um, that, we are just now beginning to work on storage of electricity. It works the same for every electrical source. So coal plants don't store electricity. Nuclear plants don't store electricity. Wind and solar don't store it. If you stick a gigantic battery next to it, you can store it. What makes the nuclear facility capable of producing power is that it can run 24 hours a day, night and day, and, and generally never stops unless they run out of water and melt down. But um, uh, Anderson Cooper said nuclear can store electricity and wind and solar can't, and that's actually not true. So anyway, aside from that, uh, first big issue out of the gate, um, both of those are addressing the issue of climate change, uh, but they, they do not, uh, or they wrestle with in different ways, what is in my opinion, a larger issue uh, or, or a second issue that must be addressed. And that is growth. And since it's harder, since we're not in a, a classroom setting where I can call on somebody, I'm not gonna ask you to tell me uh, which video has a larger issue with the problem of growth. Uh, but I think that the Bill Gates solution, the, the technology solution, the technological solution, uh, runs into that fallacy. And, and it is uh, one that we as humans have wrestled with for a long time. Uh, we want to fix our problems, but we want everything that we want right now, uh, we just want it cleaner and better. Uh, and Bill Gates was talking about that at the very end without even maybe realizing it. He's spending $7 million a year doing carbon offsets so he can fly his private plane around the world. He wants to continue living the pace of life that he has always lived or has come to expect. And I don't blame Bill Gates for that. Virtually every single one of us wants to continue living uh, the sort of lifestyle that we want. We don't want grapes for the two months of the year that they're in season. We want nice, firm, delicious grapes 12 months a year at every grocery store that we go into. We want avocados from Mexico just in time for the Super Bowl. These are the sorts of elements of our lifestyle that we're not willing to give up. And the, the technological solution uh, is always rooted in that problem of growth. How do we fix the harm that we're doing uh, so that we can keep living the fast-paced lives that humans have come to expect in the Industrial Revolution. And I've talked about the Port Village uh, and in other places, but I have, I almost personally feel like 
climate change is less the problem and almost a symptom of the problem. Uh, the real problem being our rapid consumption of natural resources. Uh, because this has been what has been fueling humans for centuries. It's not simply a race for fossil fuels and fossil carbon, but it is, it is a race, sorry about that. It is a race about all, um, a race for all of uh, the natural resources that we can get our hands on. Um, we have talked about the rapid depletion of the Ogallala Aquifer. Uh, in Western Kansas, due to largely due to irrigation for crops, that uh, may not have as immediate an impact on climate change as, say, burning fossil fuels in a coal-fired power plant. Uh, but does that have a long-term impact on our climate? Of course, uh, massive. Um, or, and does it have long-term impact on our ecosystem? Absolutely. Massive use of uh, industrial or synthetic fertilizers on our farms. Uh, they, uh, I, you know, we can explain exactly how they impact the climate, but climate is not necessarily their biggest impact. Uh, it's them flowing into our river systems and then creating hypoxic zones, whether it's in the rivers themselves or in particular in the Midwest and corn country ending up in one of the world's largest hypoxic zones, the Gulf hypoxic zone down in the Gulf of Mexico. Again, not automatically a climate change issue, but it speaks to the larger problem of rapid resource consumption. Uh, and when you create technological fixes that, um, that, help alleviate the problems that you've caused. One of the traps that you always fall into is Jevons paradox. Jevons paradox, of course, comes from industrial Britain uh, right at the turn of the century when uh, he figured out that uh, instead of, they were, had hoped to make the consumption of coal far more efficient. And uh, they hoped by making it more efficient, they would use less of it. Uh, Jevon came up with the uh, mathematical formula to demonstrate that actually when you make things more efficient, then you make the resource itself cheaper. And guess what? Instead of using less of it, you use a lot more of it because now you have more resources in the form of money. Uh, and so you're like, wow, this coal, which is super handy. Uh, used to be really expensive, and so I used it to heat our house. Now we're going to use it to do all sorts of fun things with. Uh, and that's Jevons' paradox, and it works whether you're talking about coal or water or soil or how we value any of our natural resources. Um, the more technological fixes we place on them to maybe fix the problem of climate change or carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, the more we are likely creating a scenario where those resources are less valued or valuable to humans, which then means we will consume them at an even faster pace. So dealing with growth is one of the great challenges to um, addressing the technological problem. Now, do we simply then look at Bill Gates and the technological solution and say, well, he's entirely wrong and Woody Harrelson and the uh, kiss the ground folks are entirely right? Uh, no, because in some ways, and, and maybe some of you have seen that documentary, uh, but in some ways, the, the more natural approach to growing our food people uh, are caught in that same trap. Uh, they want all of the wildly different vegetables that they can get at a market all the time. Uh, and in fact, sometimes they're caught in the trap of believing that if they can grow them all locally, uh, then they're doing the entire planet a favor, when in reality, sometimes a good argument could be made um, that things should be grown where they grow best and not forced into an environment where they shouldn't be. And 
Uh, New England in particular has always amused me. There are many movements in New England to grow more grains there because uh, those individuals want to have local grains available for their bread baking. Um, and, uh, and what's interesting is if you look at the climate and the ecosystem of New England, it is a forest. The, that ecosystem wants to be a forest. So if you want to grow grains in New England, it means that you are cutting down trees or keeping fields that have been fields for maybe 300 or 400 years um, in a prairie style uh, when they in truth want to be forests. And are you doing the ecosystem any benefits by trying to shoehorn grains into an environment where they should not be at all. And they are likely doing ecological damage no matter how hard you're trying to grow them under perfect conditions with all your compost and all of the uh, bio-nutrient cycling and everything else that you're gonna try. If you're sticking grains in New England, they probably shouldn't be there. Uh, so both of those videos uh, are trying to address climate change, uh, but they really don't address our problem, uh, either equal to climate change or are sometimes I think it's even worse of, of growth. Um, and it's really interesting for us as people of faith to gather and, and wrestle with these because uh, the growth mindset is relatively new among humans. Uh, you know, most of the time our mindset was built on survival. Uh, you know, do we have enough food uh, to feed our immediate family and immediate clan that we're with? And then as we began to practice uh, cultivated agriculture, it allowed us to um, have a little more stability so that we weren't working on our diet on a day in and day out basis. But if you look at you know, early New Testament or Old Testament stories, uh, they are often built around again do we simply have enough grain in storage to handle seven years of famine if that's what we end up having? It's a question of uh, do we have enough supply uh, to meet our demand? Whereas particularly in the last 150 years with the growth of the Industrial Revolution, uh, we have shifted now to uh, we are very focused on that demand. Um, and there, you know, we'll meet the supply. The, system can meet the supply, but we have to keep the demand high. And you are all very much aware of how much uh, ink is spent uh, in our national media talking about our national growth rates. And uh, almost both political parties uh, talk about it very openly, that they want to see growth as big and as robust and as strong as it can be. And while that can mean great things for employment, High growth is almost always attached with rapid resource consumption, rapid resource consumption. And if we don't address that, then all of the fixes that we have for carbon, uh, be they technological or they are more holistic or natural, uh, are going to be moot. Uh, so that's the first point I wanted to talk about. Uh, the second point I want to talk about and, and this one is intended to be a provocative statement. Um, but what if the best farmers are the biggest ones right now? Uh, what if, you know, we watch the, a video like Kiss the Ground and we see beautiful imagery of people that are managing a 20-acre farm or a 40-acre farm or a 100-acre farm, and uh, they've got all the an different animals and they're working in harmony. Uh, what if the best farmers are in fact the gigantic farmers that are often pilloried? Uh, as being problems in the first place. Um, and I say that to talk about another video that we didn't watch this evening, but I, I bet many of you have probably watched, uh, if you saw the video, um, The Biggest Little Farm, the documentary. 
Uh, and that was a beautifully shot story of a couple that had no experience whatsoever going back and, and going to find themselves on a holistic farm in California. Uh, it was a great documentary, did very well. It was very entertaining to watch. Um, but if you watch that documentary, and spoiler alert if you didn't, sorry, I'm going to talk about it. Uh, they lost vast numbers of their livestock to coyotes and other predators. Huge, huge numbers of their livestock, chickens in particular, uh, to coyotes. And uh, it became an ongoing story of theirs. How are we going to address those coyotes? And uh, it made for a great documentary, and they were really loved chickens and so it was tragic and and you felt for them and you felt for the chickens um but i have always uh wondered that we as americans in particular love this idea of going back to nature and exploring that and i certainly uh want agriculture to be open to anyone that um uh wants to take part in it uh, but is there value to agriculture being practiced uh, largely by people that are um, very, very good at it? And I say that uh, because if you visit farms of farmers that are farming like 50,000 acres at a time, which is a mind boggling number, uh, but, but you visit the farmers that are covering 50,000 acres at a time, they are typically your early adopters. They have all of the technology um, so that they can apply their fertilizer and their chemical and they apply seed rates uh, exactly toward how that field ought to be planted and managed. And that is not inconsequential. Uh, when you look at, um, watersheds in Iowa that have nutrient problems, we know that the bulk of those flushes of nitrogen and phosphorus occur not steadily over time, but typically around major weather events. And they also come from the same general farms each time. So it's the farmers that maybe are late getting their fertilizer down so they get it down right in front of a storm, even though they know it might be a bad time. It's the farmers that are practicing tillage in a manner that is um, not helpful for their own soil, uh, which most large farmers uh, try to manage for because they know how to do that. It's the farmers that um, may not have the financial wherewithal to afford a a planter that can handle variable seeding rates uh, so that they don't have the satellite imagery of their fields and know the, all the data about how exactly those fields performed on an acre by acre or even square meter by square meter basis. Um, they don't have that data because they don't have the technology. Therefore, they're not able to implement uh, the new scientific practices. So yes, uh, those big farmers that are operating 50,000 acres may be using a ton of chemical and a ton of genetically modified crops. Um, but if we were to drive an agricultural revolution uh, that had a large impact, um, you know, really beyond just the mom and pop farms getting going, um, and I mean for this to be a provocative statement, is there more value in engaging those very large farmers that have sort of figured out how to use technology uh, to better practice agriculture on a meter by meter basis? Uh, or should we have a gigantic influx of new people that are returning back to smaller farms but otherwise have no idea how to manage livestock. Um, I'll share one other anecdote about this uh, from my own operation. So we have a cow-calf herd and I grew up around cattle and we've had cattle on our farm for a very, very long time. And 
I'm very familiar with how to keep that cow-calf herd healthy. I know uh, what the cows need while they're milking so that they produce enough milk for their calves. I know exactly how to manage them uh, in the cold. Uh, during the February weather event, uh, we calve all of our cows right out uh, in, in front of uh, this building because it's uh, proximal to getting the calves inside. And uh, proudly, uh, we had a calf born in the coldest hour of the coldest day. I think it was February 16th or whatever it was. Uh, but he was born right outside here. His, his uh, knuckles had frozen, so he couldn't even get up and walk. But I had him inside. I had Jackson, our oldest rubbing him down for an hour and a half. And then we returned him to his mom and he ended up with just a few uh, frozen ears and a little bit of a frozen tail, but he was otherwise okay. So we know how to manage um, our cow herd. In the meantime, as a project for two years now, we have tried to have chickens on our farm, but we have a very large and healthy population of raccoons. And Last year, the raccoons broke into our chicken uh, pen and uh, killed all of the chickens the first day we left for vacation, which was tragic and very sad. We elected to start it again this year. Uh, I, I built the pen up even better than it was before. Uh, and then on Easter night, and sorry, this is a horrible story, but I think these are important when we discuss farms. Uh, on Easter night, the raccoons came back in again. They could not get into the pen, but they managed to reach through the wires. They grabbed two chickens, and then they held them up to the wires and ate what they could off of those two chickens until they couldn't get any more through the wires. I cannot think of a more horrible end uh, for the poor two chickens, and I was so mad in the morning, ultimately, I was mad at the raccoons, but I was ultimately mad at myself because I didn't bring those chickens into the world to make them suffer a horrible, horrible, horrible death at the hands of those raccoons. Um, and so I began to think, should I be doing chickens at all, if that's not my principal object because they're great projects for the kids, but right now all it is is an enormous amount of tragedy uh, that ultimately is about chickens dying at the hands of raccoons. And while those can teach life lessons, if we are about a smaller carbon footprint and smarter ways of doing things, should we not perhaps the individual know how to manage chickens very well? Um, to prevent that kind of loss, because it's not only a tragic loss where chickens end up dead, but it's also an enormous loss of energy if you were raising chickens and the feed that's required to have grow. Uh, if you have them all die at the hands of raccoons, you're ultimately costing the ecological system um, uh, ecological capital. So the that's the second provocative question. Um, you know, should we perhaps be leaning on the bigger farmers rather than the smaller farmers? Uh, and then the third provocative question that I will put forward, and then we can kind of open it up to a, a group discussion, is um, should we, uh, or, or excuse me, is can can things that seem too good to be true uh, sometimes, in fact, be simply too good to be true. And uh, I will end then just sing a little bit, the kiss the ground. Um, uh, and Chris, I'll get to that, get to that question in a little bit. So uh, I'll end by discussing the, the kiss the ground story. So um, one of the individuals in kiss the ground featured is Alan Savory, who is a um, proponent of the intensive grazing practices, which is a wonderful way to manage a herd. That is um, mimicking nature as close to just about anything you could have, because as we know about the prairies, the bison didn't sort of stay on one pasture all summer. They would move through, and when they would come through, they would basically pulverize everything into 
um, pulverize everything into oblivion and then would sit idle for a long time and then it would regenerate. And the prairie sort of managed itself that way. It likes to be uh, abused by hooves and abused by mouths and to have those puck marks in place and then it can regenerate itself. And so Alan Savory has done a great job of showing how that patch grazing can make such an impact. My issue with Alan Savory is he also talks about the enormous amount of carbon that he believes we can put back into the soil by practicing that intense grazing. And one of the things that we learned at the Land Institute is that when you open the prairies, uh, when we opened the prairies here in North America um, 150 years ago, these were our, the pioneers that came out with the plow and ripped up the prairies. Uh, we lost uh, enormous amounts of carbon within the first three to five years. I mean, it, it's, a, it's really a race to get that carbon in those early crops, uh, and then it's gone. And it takes an enormous amount of time to re-sequester that similar amount of carbon. And it takes that amount of time because prairies are by nature slow marginal ecosystems if you want to store a lot of carbon you should be a rainforest rainforests store enormous amounts of carbon prairies uh, particularly high plains short grass prairies are very slow it takes centuries uh, to build up soil, it takes centuries to build up carbon. So Alan Savory and others uh, love to talk about implementing a patch grazing. Uh, they talk about, well, what happens when we do this patch grazing is then in 10 to 15 years, you have restored the carbon back to the way it was uh, prior to the plow. And that's simply not the case. Uh, and it is wishful thinking on our part similar to the technical questions that Bill Gates was asking or the technological problems that he put forward. Um, uh, the, those problems uh, occur when you think that you can have um, uh, quick and simple solutions uh, to those uh, larger problems. Uh, when we opened up the prairies, uh, when we um, expended that carbon, uh, that's when problems began and uh, they are not easily fixed. So those are my three big questions. Uh, I'm going to go try to go look at the chats here on my screen. Um, and from Chris Avery, she asked the question, uh, but how do you have eco-diversity if you um, only have large experts producing with a comparative advantage? And I think, I mean, the eco-diversity is the problem. Uh, and it's the, it's the paradox that we run into. Um, one of the elements of diversity that I am a strong believer in is that I think all farms should be diversified. They should have both crops and livestock. I think that livestock are an important part of um, making a farm's ecosystem whole or a circle. Uh, and it's not perfect, uh, but they can provide the fertility and, and uh, balancing the needs of what a pasture needs versus what a field needs. Um, but what we've seen over the last, uh, in particular, 50 years is that people want to specialize. They either want to be the best corn grower uh, and focus on that, or they want to be the best uh, raiser of cattle, and they don't want to do the same things. And that diversity is really important. Um, can you get the larger farmers with the so-called comparative advantage to shift to a system where they have more um, both dual crop and livestock operations? I don't know. That's hard. And and you know, I asked that secondary question. Um, uh, with that in mind, you know, how do we fix this problem of um, practicing a better form of agriculture, uh, but doing it fast enough in a way we're not training a lot of brand new people from Brooklyn that, that don't know how to do it.
uh, there's other questions. Let me see here. Uh, May I ask you a follow up? This is Chris Avery. Yes. I use the term comparative advantage on purpose because that is the term that's used for global neoliberal uh, economy as we have it, which told each country, do what you do best and then we'll ship it around, right? Yes. And uh, that of course is the extreme on a very, on a global scale. But part of the problem with it is not only is it more energy intensive, obviously, you know, the supply chain is spread out and has all that fossil fuels that are needed, but also, and, and so you're talking about more like on a domestic level, don't grow grain in New England. I get that. And that, and even, even the, that would be the things that you ship. If you need for your own health to have some kind of grain, maybe you don't, you know, you ship it into to New England, which is a very good point. But the part of the comparative advantage thing is at what point do you become so focused on the one thing that you're already into the monoculture, to the fragility of um, what you're now vulnerable to. So even though a person may be better at growing chickens, uh, still if there's a chicken disease that comes along, <laughs> it's gonna wipe you out on a big scale. You just have farther to fall. Yes. And I think that's what I'm getting into is you're, you're speaking in a kind of a national level, but also a global level. And, and I guess the other thing is in the US uh, in the past few decades, there's been incredible mergers. I mean, our dad was a farmer, right? You know, and he was having trouble hanging on during get bigger and get out. And he managed to hang on for another 20 years and did a great job as a small farmer. However, you know, most of the places around the world haven't merged to that degree. Is that right? So on the same time that they may or may not be using good practices, uh, it's not like the U.S. where the mergers have already happened. So I guess that's just something I'm wondering about that for you to reflect on. Well, and I would say, I mean, like Africa is a great example. It's probably um, between Africa and India, the best examples of uh, we almost grow everything in a monoculture environment. And that's not, um, that's not atypical, even in history. I mean, we've been producing wheat in a sort of a monoculture environment for 10,000 years. Uh, but in Africa, there are still uh, limited um, polyculture environments, uh, which are definitely, I mean, if we want to really begin to explore fertility in fields, uh, um, we have to get to a polyculture environment where um, your crop, because I can tell you, it's difficult to see from this, um, uh, from behind me, but this turns a field gets the bulk of its fertility from the cattle that graze there over the winter months. And I stock them high there and they like to stay there because it's green. It's not remotely enough fertility. This field is nitrogen starved. So then I take the manure from the lot where we keep cattle and it's only maybe 60 head of cattle. So I don't have a feed lot, but I have a lot where they stay in the winter so they're all together and it's easier to manage them. I take that manure and I spread it on here and it's still not enough. So to make the sort of high levels of production that we need to feed the planet, uh, we need some other form of fertility. And, um, w you know, we can explore that with polycultures, which I think is really interesting. Uh, but it you know, we can also raise the question, uh, what if we produced synthetic fertilizers? There are um, upstart companies in the Bay Area that are exploring making what we call green hydrogen. So they take a wind farm. One of the problems with a wind farm is that um, we use all, most of our electricity during the day. We don't use very much at night. Well, wind blows at night in Kansas, sometimes as much as it blows in the day. So that's basically, those are dead electrons because back to what I said earlier, we can't store them. And so we could either come up with a way to store them, but there are also companies now in the Bay Area that are saying, what if we take that electricity, otherwise being wasted, and channel it into making hydrogen, which is, 
um, the first step toward making um, ammonium nitrate fertilizer. So they could then make what they're calling green fertilizer from those wind farms. Here's the kicker. So it doesn't come from fossil fuels, which is where most of the fertilizer comes from right now. So that's a great benefit. Very good. But it's still a synthetic fertilizer that uh, you know used in abundance will eventually find its way through the soil and down into the rivers. Not so good. So how do we balance um, the potential benefit of green hydrogen from renewables, which is very real, uh, with the problem of synthetic fertilizer is synthetic fertilizer. Um, and those are, those are challenges. I mean, I, I mean for these evening discussions to be more provocative than answers, but uh, those, are, those are the challenges. And again, like one benefit of the Land Institute's work on perennial, um, uh, perennial grains is that the benefit of a perennial is that I can apply fertilizer. I have, the, this is certified organic, so I don't put synthetic fertilizer on it. Uh, but if I had a magic wand that could control the United States government's USDA's organic certifications, I would allow them to put, uh, let me put synthetic fertilizer on this field. And the reason being, uh, the beauty of a perennial field like this is that it's very forgiving in terms of when you put that fertilizer down. The problem with fertilizer, say in, in Iowa, is that if you put it down in winter and the ground's frozen and then you suddenly get a fluke six inch rain, you're gonna lose vast amounts of it down into the watershed because there's no root system to take up that uh, fertilizer and do anything with it. Um, a field of perennial grass that's there and semi-dormant through the winter can do something with that fertilizer no matter when you put it down. And that changes the equation in terms of the threat to the watersheds from synthetic fertilizer. Um, so anyway, that's, uh, that's one, of, um, one of the things I wrestle with in terms of uh, what we do with uh, uh, our um, need for fertility in the crops that we grow. You know, how much can we get from polycultures? How much can we get from uh, more livestock on the ground? Uh, but eventually, does that ever get us enough to where we need to be? Uh, there's a few other chat things. Um, Uh, and Al, when you were talking about the green powerhouse to put you on the spot, were you referring to like green hydrogen or? Unmute, unmute. No, that is yes. the, uh, Michael Smith developed this system that can regenerate uh, the soil much faster than anything we know about right now and it it's a closed loop system it uses wood waste or waste uh to uh, create the power and then it uh uses algae and some other uh things and it's a circ circular system it's talked about in the documentary the need to grow the need to grow and the food revolution uh so that's where that, that is. You can go to uh, the Green Powerhouse and find out more about it. Um, but it, it was a, uh, in, in the documentary, The Need to Grow. So it, it looks like great promise. Uh, some, some company, a company is trying to build some more of them. Uh, each one of them can, uh, uh, the byproduct of the powerhouse is the electricity, which is a byproduct because the primary thing is the uh, char that's used to regenerate the soil so that it can produce. Biochar, bio like the terra preta from Brazil, probably the, the black earth. 
Uh, yes, biochar, yeah. right, that's produced by this machine, or it's actually a, a system, a comp. You need to take a look at it. Just go look at the green powerhouse and do some investigating in that department. The, and, the, the need to grow is the documentary. And yeah, and I, I have not seen that one. I appreciate uh, you putting it forward for the whole group too. But uh, again, I mean, the takeaway I've had um, over the years is just uh, there seems to be the necessity of balancing a little bit of both or whatever it is as we... Um, as we move forward on this, Jevons paradox always sits out there as the problem that if we if we fix for these, um, have we created a, another problem for ourselves because we're consuming resources too fast? Um, I, you know, I also have wrestled with uh, uh, the the topic du jour right now of uh, meat consumption. And, and um, Bill Gates talked about that a bit in his interview. Um, I struggle with uh, both modern practices of meat consumption, particularly chicken and pork, but also beef when it's finished in, in uh, feedlots, which almost, almost all beef is. Uh, but at the same time, I look at the ecosystems in which my beef spend the bulk of their lives, uh, they do end up getting sold at a sale barn, and I'm certain that they end up at a feedlot, uh, but they spend the bulk of their lives out on um, not simply pasture, because uh, you know, there's blue stem pasture in Kentucky that's heavily managed and fertilized just like it was a field, uh, but the beauty of Kansas is that we, we still have true native prairie pastures. Uh, that have not been touched by a plow. And they're incredibly diverse in terms of the um, plants that are offered there. Uh, and my cattle spend the bulk of their time on those. Um, is it more of an impact, again, if we not simply look at climate change, but we look at the overall ecosystem, is it more of an impact adversely uh, that my cattle uh, end up in a feedlot for the final three months of their lives uh, versus producing, um, you know, for these uh, synthetic or vegetable-based beef, uh, largely soybean grown in monocultures uh, in field environments that aren't remotely similar to the prairies that uh, our cattle are in. Uh, there's that uh, scene in the trailer of Kiss the Ground where the farmer is standing next to the fallow field that was fallowed by chemical versus his field that has the paddocks for the cattle. And he says, this is what the consumer wants. And that is exactly true. I mean, the consumers, uh, particularly consumers that are ecologically minded, but even all consumers, would prefer that their food is coming from the bucolic setting of cattle out in a pasture somewhere uh, enjoying themselves rather than a gigantic monoculture environment, um, even if it's one that's certified organic in the, in the Central Valley of California, uh, that causes, uh, you know, consumers don't want that. And I would argue um, that it's hard to say that that's better than just producing the actual beef. So uh, yeah, those are the things that I even wrestle with. Um, uh, you were asking about how, um, uh, yeah, explain how energy is stored from nuclear, solar, wind, or coal. Um, yeah. so. The only reason I brought that up is it always drives me nuts when they get things wrong in documentaries, but um, you can't. So when electricity is produced, it's put onto the grid and, and that grid has to be um, uh, stabilized at a certain rate. So that power is going to be used basically right away. And if they don't, if the people that manage the grid don't need the power, then they'll shut uh, generators off or curtail them because they just don't need the power on the grid at the particular time. So if you were to ever store that, uh, you 
need a storage system and they are beginning to build storage attached particularly to wind and solar and they look basically those batteries basically look like great big shipping containers and they fill those shipping containers with smaller batteries and then they can store that power and it's usually like an overnight deal so you take the power that was produced overnight if it's a wind farm uh, and then it's called upon the next day at four o'clock in the afternoon when everybody turns their air conditioners on. And um, you're still producing a giant battery filled with a lot of rare earth minerals. So it poses a lot of problems. Uh, but one of the cool things about these storage batteries is that they're basically made up of a ton of smaller car batteries. And they think uh, what these will be in the future will be uh, mostly semi-used car batteries from electric vehicles. And they will have, you know, for that car battery to be at peak function in that electric vehicle, it, it can't drop below like 80% efficiency or something. I, I don't know the exact number. So once that battery drops below 80% efficiency, they don't want it in that car. So then they take it out. But a battery with 80% efficiency still has a lot of useful uh, capacity in it. So then they assemble these larger storage facilities for large generating units um, made up of a lot of smaller, uh, um, somewhat used electric car batteries. Uh, we are just starting to see that begin, but I, I think that's, um, that will be a cool technological advance in terms of uh, balancing out the needs of our electric grid. I mean, the argument against wind and solar has always been, well, the wind doesn't blow all the time. Well, the sun only shines during the day. If you can adequately store power off of those two generating forms, uh, you don't need nuclear, you don't need coal, you don't, I mean, it, 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 it's an absolute game changer in terms of what's needed. This is uh, Jerry, I have a, a thought followed by a question. It seems to me, watching these two approaches, that the nature-based uh, approaches in Kiss the Ground are processes that have worked for eons. They're already there. It's more easily to scale them up, them up than something that requires research and scale up. Uh, I, I was watching the video uh, a month ago or so with, when Greta was interviewing somebody in the UK who was talking about his direct capture fans. And he admitted it would probably take him 10 years or longer to scale up to where he could even begin to uh, uh, extract carbon from the atmosphere in a meaningful way. So it seems to me that, like you said, it's, it's got to be both approaches, but uh, it seems to me the natural way is already with us is more and is more readily uh, more can be more readily scaled up. Uh, it uh, you know I, I frequently reference the land institute, but I think it's just such a nice meld of of the two ideas. We had spirited discussions around the table at the land institute. Uh, if you could, if you had a magic gene. A genetically modified gene that you could splice into a grain to make it perennial, would you do it? Uh, and we had great discussions on that because, um, yeah, with the sort of atmospheric carbon reduction stuff uh, that uh, I'm not a scientist, but just looking at six big fans sucking air out of the atmosphere and pulling the carbon out of it makes me say, this is this has got to do more energy than we're really saving here. Um, but at the same time, uh, as Wes Jackson says, the problem in agriculture is agriculture. Uh, it is us practicing agriculture. The moment we opened the soils, uh, we started causing trouble. And so the people that, um, want to get back to composting and, uh, and um, uh, you know, cover crops, all of those are infinitely better than what we're doing, but they're all still bad. 
uh, you know, our perennial ecosystems are the way nature has managed itself for millions of years. When we try to manage agriculture in an annual system, uh, we are doomed to continue losing soil and continue having fertility problems uh, because nature just was not designed to do that. Uh, so then you ask yourself, what's the fastest way to get then back to a perennial system? Is it through natural holistic ways to get there or is it through intense scientific technological ways to get there? And, and I, that's a complicated answer. I think I saw another. Uh, is it safe to say most mega farmers and food crops use insecticides that adversely affect pollinators? This needs to change. Uh, yes, I mean, that's, so even the, we know neonicotinoids now, which are the primary uh, class of chemicals that are used with, with corn and soybeans, um, cause problems with bees and others. But I, I think that um, all chemical use obviously uh, creates trouble for, um, for not only pollinators, but insects in general and birds. Uh, and animals up and down the food chain. Um, you know, worms are such a huge part of a healthy soil and um, they can be really adversely affected by some of the chemicals that are, that are used. And yeah, when you are a mega farmer, you use those. But back to my sort of intent on being provocative, the mega farmer is probably applying those Per the regulations of the um, the the label, whether or not we feel like that's enough cover or not, but they're probably applying those better in some cases than some smaller farmer that's got an older sprayer and just does not pay attention to their uh, uh, to their levels that much. And so it's hard to say that the mega farmers are directly the, the huge problems there. And then finally, Chris Avery, are there viable storage methods that don't need rare earth? So I recall one that pushes a train up a hill when extra winds are available and let it roll back down when needed. Oh, that, so that's a great, um, that's a great question. It was, uh, oh, uh, Bill Gates in his interview talks about he's investing in that company that was injecting water underground under pressure. And then the pressurized uh, removal of that water then uh, produces energy when, so you're basically storing energy that way. Uh, again, I'm not a geologist, but um, back to this, sometimes if it sounds too good to be true, it might be. The little I know about pressurized liquids are the following. One, uh, the enormous dearth of earthquakes that have been happening in South Central Kansas and Oklahoma are not necessarily because of fracking, which is when the ground is sort of uh, um, popped apart so that hydrocarbons can be released. They're produced because the waste liquid that comes up from that fracking is then sent back down to underground injection wells uh, and pressurized because of that. And the resulting pressure then creates instability in ancient uh, fissures and um, fault lines that we sometimes didn't even know about. So, it, you know, as I listened to Bill Gates explaining that, I had to think, well, gosh, what happens if we start sticking up, you know, I know the geologists think they may have found the perfect formation to stick that water down into to then pull it back up later uh, and expect the energy of, of the pressure of the water. But what if we just keep producing low level induced seismicity because of that, um, which I think is uh, potentially a real problem. The other situation, of course, we had, we store natural gas that way. And I was at Sterling College in the late 90s, early 2000s, when Hutchinson basically was because the field of natural gas that was stored underneath found three or four avenues out of its dome uh, came to the surface and, um, you know, destroyed multiple buildings. So uh, anytime you stick things down underground, under pressure, stuff may happen. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I see Chris's comment about I don't trust Gates on everything. Uh, you know, I think that um, uh, that's a good thing for you. Um, but yeah, sometimes you can get so caught up in the technological solution uh, that you don't realize that you're either creating a bigger problem or you're not fixing that problem at all anyway. Uh, Jerry, we're at 8.30. I, you know, I don't want to, like, people can leave if they want to go. Um, can I just do one little follow up here? I was, oh yeah, I was motivated to run over to the bookshelf and say, where is that a non Giridaridas book <laughs> about why we shouldn't trust elites? Because, um, the one thing they will never tackle is the system that keeps them elite. Now, that is not to say that by juxtaposition, an elite might not happen onto something that's good and help support it, but you have to be really careful about the support because in the end, once you're on their feed, they will dictate, you know, direction and uh, Bloomberg and Bezos also, <laughs> and the rest of them. So this, this book of winners take all deals with that. I might respond to Josh's question about continuing. I know that uh, in past uh, when if we haven't, uh, if people are hanging on and the conversation seems to be going well, we've exceeded 90, you know, we've gone longer than 90 minutes. And in that, in that vein, I wanted to uh, ask you about pressurized air uh, stored in salt caverns, which is something that Joe Spies has promoted over the years. Some of you may know Joe Spies. Uh, you know, when you just pump the air down and then, you know, perhaps that it, the, the flow of air coming back up uh, creates the energy, I, I can see that, uh, but the other sort of pressurized air, there have been um, pilot trials in South Central Kansas uh, that have tried to pump CO2 down underground. Um, and I just... Uh, you know, I, I hate to, because air is slightly different. Uh, it's not, you know, if it escapes, it doesn't necessarily take any problem, make any problems. Um, but there's still those just technological fixes to our problems of overconsumption. And you just have to think if we do it too much, uh, it's eventually going to cause some problem that we have yet to, you know, we have yet to foresee. Um, you know, air in a dome that's just coming back up out of turbine fans and spinning them uh, is, at least to me, a little easier to predict, um, but you just never know. Most of the things you've talked about, you've talked about the United States. How, how applicable are the kinds of solutions that you've talked about to the rest of the world? Uh, I mean, not very. We practice a very different and more intense agriculture here. Um, but we all have follow up with um, 40 years uh, with inside the agricultural fields of the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus where the, the same on that campus is Norlog. And uh, I was at an event, I actually lived in uh, an area where a lot of uh, professors who lived, uh, who worked at the campus uh, lived. It's really deserves statehood, but basically he has just enabled uh, population growth that should not have existed uh, given the resources uh, that exist in that in uh, a lot of the countries where it has been adopted. Well, and the other thing about uh, Norman was that his great breakthrough was really just gigantic application of huge amounts of fertilizer. Mm -hmm. uh, if you if you pour investment in uh, creating so much trouble in our waterways, particularly up near where you are. Well, this is Jerry again. We've dropped from the high watermark of 33 
about uh, 20 people. So I might call for one or two more questions and then we'll let uh, Josh go out and have some supper. Any more questions? If you have any other questions too, Jerry knows how to get a hold of me and he is free to disseminate my uh, contact information. And um, sure. yeah, we're happy to happy to talk in the future. But we're hoping that uh, uh, we can uh, stitch together this recording that has started and stopped and uh, uh, make it available to people. Uh, we've had that done with other, uh, recently since we've been on Zoom, we've been su successful in, uh, recording uh, presentations and distributing those with people. I have one quick question. So I I have some Kernza that I bought at the Land Institute that it's in my freezer to have baked with a little bit, but I can't find any place to actually buy it anymore um, other than, you know, wholesale, but I can't do that. So any ideas where to get some Kernza? Oh, I, I, I should know this. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have 5,000 pounds sitting right outside this door, but you don't want that. Um, uh, I, so Tessa Peters, who runs the Kernza portion for the land suit, would certainly know. I, I, there's hiccups as we get started, you know, uh, in terms of connecting buyers to uh, uh, connecting the whole market. And so, yeah, I, you are not alone. I think there's a lot of people that would prefer to have a little more of it. Um, I'm going to see Tessa here in the next couple of days anyway, and I'll just ask her and then uh, we can, I can get, get that to Jerry and he can disseminate it out to everyone. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. I, th I think we had a, a good turnout and we stayed engaged, learned a little bit. Maybe we were provoked a little bit. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So, Josh, I'm headed out your way on Friday, hopefully. Oh, it's good. That's okay, come right. Colorado. I'll be, I'll be counting the windmills as we go by uh, west of Hutchinson and beyond. Uh, matter of fact, right as you hit the windmills, you're going over Lincoln Hill, that big tall hill. Yeah. And uh, if you, right as you go down that, about another half mile down the hill, if, if you look to the south, that great big tall ridge along to the south, right over that ridge is one of our fields of Kernza. It's clear up there by interstate. So okay, it's, uh, it's kind of a fun I, I thought you'd be giving a little more report about wind in Kansas. How's wind in Kansas? It's good. Keep growing. So... We uh, put up a, two or three new wind farms every year, so it's been pretty exciting. As we head across Kansas and on into Colorado, as we approach Lima, now there's even uh, 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 wind turbines in that area. That are yes. Up. Yeah, quite a few. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jerry. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming tonight. And we'll have another program next next month and be looking out for an email from me and Jerry and others uh, advertising it. Thanks. I might mention, if anybody is still still on, that we've uh, tentatively scheduled uh, Dr. Rick Randolph for Monday night, uh, July 19th. He's going to talk about the, uh, the connection between climate change, collapsing ecosystems, and the rise of pandemics in the past now and in the future. So that's what we think we have next on the table. Very good. All right. All right good night, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you. All right.